old preconceived uh, ideas about this kind of diet. In fact, it was the opposite. I was raised on a dairy farm. The first in my family to go to college, uh, especially go to graduate school. When I got to graduate school, I, I actually did my doctoral dissertation on, with my professor, of course, uh, promoting uh, protein, so-called high-quality protein. That meant the protein in meat, milk, and eggs. That was my dissertation, going out into the world to promote more consumption of that kind of nutrient, that kind of food. Uh, so uh, I got to where I got to because just as it happened, um, I first got involved in the Philippines. I was the coordinator of a nationwide program for free malnourished children with my senior colleague. We went there in order to um, make sure these malnourished children got enough protein. That's in my wheelhouse, and more or less is. But when I was there, I saw something unusual. The children most likely to get a pretty common cancer in the Philippines, a liver cancer, were coming from the families, the few families, who were consuming the most protein. I mean, it was, it was just an anecdotal thing. It wasn't published. But I, I got this impression uh, that instead, the ones who consumed the most protein had the most problems. The bigger and stronger and all that sort of thing. They were the richer class. But their children were getting cancer at a higher rate. So I then organized my research effort, my research program in those days with National Institutes of Health funding, NIH funding. Then, then it lasted for the next 27 years, that one project. Really just getting into the science. I wanted to know, I mean, we could, here we're pushing protein, but here I'm saying this. We've got to understand that. So, and it was also a publication came out at that time from India experimental animals, rats, that showed the higher the protein, more cancer. So that's what my research was about. I mean, we had, I had these two opposite sort of points of view. I got into that and had a, a good-sized research group, plenty of funding. I published all of it and uh, found out that it was the opposite. Animal protein turns on cancer. Animal protein pushes up cholesterol levels in the blood. Therefore, it pushes heart disease formation. Animal protein's got a lot of problems with it. So it was, for me, I had no ideological um, preconsiderations, if you will, about what it should be. In fact, if anything, it was the opposite. But the data said something different. There's two answers to that. Uh, countries who consume more animal protein, more, if you will, calories, that's not significant, but nonetheless, countries consuming more animal-based foods tend to be the richer countries. They just tend to be the richer countries because it's more expensive to produce that kind of food. Therefore, you will see some, their, their total height is higher, their this or that, uh, and so, uh, and they're not subjected to the infectious diseases as much. You know, like smallpox, tuberculosis, and things like that. So on the one side, the countries consume that kind of diet. Some of those communicable diseases, we say, are down. It makes it look better. In countries that consume more animal food, too, individuals tend to be bigger. But that's not necessarily good health. The fastest rate of growth is not the best rate of growth. And so uh, in reality, the countries who consume animal-based foods, they got heart disease, they got diabetes, they got cancer, they got more autoimmune diseases. We are getting those diseases, whereas other countries who aren't quite where we are, um, more or less out of necessity because they oftentimes are poor, they don't get those diseases as nearly as much as we do. Well, that, that effect, one group, 100% of getting the, the disease in this experimental animal study, they're all, they all died. And that's the level that we tend to consume, often many of us. The ones given the lower levels of protein, the 5% of total calories, that is, 
um, they'll live, even though that they had gotten exposed to a high dose of carcinogen. And they had more mutations, as we say, in the trade. Um, still, they did not get cancer. The protein effect was so astounding. Nothing like that, to my knowledge, had ever, ever been seen before where the effect of a nutrient in this case, the effect was just extraordinary. And furthermore, we could turn on the cancer, that means grow it faster, or turn it off. We could turn it on when we had more protein. We could turn it off, give them a switch in the diet to low protein, back and forth, back and forth. And that was, again, that was a staggering thought. The idea that in this case, that nutrition, in the form of protein in this case, that nutrition was in control of whether we get cancer or don't get cancer. And the kind of nutrition that turns on cancer is the same thing that turns on heart disease and diabetes to a great extent. Most people consume, or a lot of people, that tend to assume that protein comes from animal foods. So your question for most people is, do we need to eat animal foods to get the protein? The answer is no. Plants have all the protein we need. It has an abundance of protein. We need the right kind of foods. And that's it. We don't need more protein than that. So there's no, absolutely no need to consume animal foods. It only adds problems, not solutions. That was the other side of the coin that was quite interesting. When this, the protein we were using to turn on cancer was animal protein, or casein in this case, from cow's milk. So that was turning it on. But when we used wheat uh, instead of that, no cancer, gone. Even when it was fed at the 20% level. Yeah, that's, uh, we, we didn't do the kind of study in rats to combine a lot of things necessarily. That's, that's uh, my interpretation of the human condition. In other words, we don't eat usually nutrients like protein by itself. We're eating whole food. And so when, when we get to that sort of understanding, then a lot of things are changing. So when we as humans are consuming animal-based foods to get that good protein, what we're doing, when we, as we start adding animal foods to our diet, we're decreasing the foods that really matter. So what oftentimes may look like an animal food effect or a animal protein effect maybe, is also partly attributed, in fact, to a major extent, attributed to the fact we're not consuming the foods we need to consume. When we consume more animal protein in the form of animal foods, we're consuming less plant foods. And those plant foods, the reason that's a problem is because the plant foods have all the goodies. They have all the antioxidants, like several of the vitamins. They have all the complex carbohydrates, which includes dietary fiber, for example. And so the plant foods, they have the really good stuff. And so in a sense, in biology, and in this case, in disease formation, um, we're, we're, it's really kind of a balance, one versus the other. Animal foods are causing the problem, plant foods are sort of depressing it. You took that seesaw to animal foods, you got problems. Uh, yeah, animal foods, one, one way to, as an indicator of animal food consumption is the amount of cholesterol that we consume. Because cholesterol is only found in animal foods. It's also indicated by a higher cholesterol level in the blood. You consume animal foods, more cholesterol in the blood. Those two things, they, they, they indicate a higher risk for heart disease. And incidentally, they indicate a higher risk for cancer. But cholesterol doesn't specifically cause these diseases. Well, that, that's a little bit of an overstatement, and some of my friends have said that about re my research, because we do have genetic variation from place to place, but in reality, um, in China, for example, 87% of the people are the same ethnic group 
the Han people, they, they say. And in that circumstance, uh, we saw ma major differences in cancer rates in different parts of China, according to what they ate, even though presumably they had a very similar genetic background. That also applies to another kind of study where people move from one country to another and keeping their genes the same. For example, Japanese, in some of these original studies, Japanese move from Japan to the west coast of the United States, whereas they did not get colon cancer and breast cancer and heart disease uh, so much when they came to the U.S. and changed their diet, keeping their genes the same. They moved to the United States, they started getting heart disease, cancer, and so forth. That leads to a really major, um, in my view, understanding or observation, if you will, Genes, you know, diseases may start with genes. There's a genetic basis for disease occurrence. Yes, that's true. But these diseases don't because, they don't occur because of these genes. They occur because of the so-called expression of these genes by nutrition. So nutrition is far more important than genetic background. That's what it comes to.